Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us for the Naval War College Foundation's annual San Francisco Symposium and first presentation of a special event series titled Artificial Intelligence on the Front Lines. I am George Lang, CEO of the Naval War College Foundation, and I am broadcasting this afternoon from the US Naval War College campus in Newport, Rhode Island, specifically Spruance Hall. I am joined remotely by the 23rd Chairman of the Naval War College Foundation's Board of Trustees, Chairman Philip Bilden. We are excited and gratified to see so many members and friends of the Foundation from across the nation participating today through our virtual platform. As many of you know, the San Francisco Symposium has been traditionally hosted by the Foundation in the springtime at the Marines Memorial Club and Hotel in San Francisco, California. Over the years, it has presented opportunities for hundreds of members and guests to interact with faculty, staff, students, and distinguished speakers to address the many challenges in our national and international security environments. A person integral to the development and success of the San Francisco Symposium is Trustee Emeritus Dick Rosenberg. Dick and his wife, Barbara, have been and continue to be longtime friends and supporters of the Naval War College and our foundation, particularly this event and we cannot thank them enough for the instrumental role they have played in the success of this program. While the remaining effects of COVID-19 have prevented us from coming together again this year in person, it will not prevent us from engaging with national security policy experts and civilian academics to expand our understanding of the great many security issues and challenges that we face today. Today's presentation will focus on artificial intelligence and digital modernization for future leaders. We are confident that you will benefit from this interactive presentation with our very distinguished guest speakers and faculty of the U.S. Naval War College who remain committed to the U.S. Naval War College as, and in the words of its founder, Rear Admiral Stephen B. Luce, a place of original research on all questions relating to war and to the statesmanship connected with war or the prevention of war. I have served as CEO of the Naval War College Foundation for just over two years, and I'm incredibly proud of our many trustees, members, benefactors, friends, and staff who have made generous contributions to the U.S. Naval War College and its mission to educate and develop our joint and combined force military and civilian leaders who will tackle the many challenges of artificial intelligence 
in order to protect our nation's security, prosperity, and democratic way of life. Their donations, your donations, make a profound difference in strengthening our national security and position of global leadership. The U.S. Naval War College is the oldest institution of its kind and counts among its alumni nearly 300 of today's active duty admirals, generals, and senior executive service leaders who, with the financial support of the Naval War College Foundation, have benefited from the college's educational organizations, accredited graduate level education programs, research and scholarship, and centers dedicated to geographic regions like the Asia Pacific, Greater Middle East, Europe, Russia, and the polar risks of the Arctic region, or specific warfare concerns like irregular warfare and maritime special operations, cyber, and now artificial intelligence. Powered by our generous members and benefactors, we are able to provide the critical funds needed to support this vital work. Today's event would not be possible without the following donors and their exceptional investment in philanthropy. At the commanding officer's sponsorship level, $10,000 or more, trustee Captain David and Mrs. Paula Hunter. At the executive officer level, $5,000, Chairman Philip and Mrs. Patricia Bilden, trustee Scott and Mrs. Alicia DePasquale, trustee Paul and Mrs. Ingrid Dimitrik, the Waring and Carmen Partridge Foundation, trustee Waring and Mrs. Carmen Partridge, and trustee Emeritus Richard and Mrs. Barbara Rosenberg. At the operations level, $2,500, Captain George and Dr. Wendy Lang, Chairman Emeritus William and Mrs. Penny Obenshane, and Trustee Emerita Hope Van Buren. And finally, at the division officer level, $1,000, Naval War College Foundation Regional Director Dale Jenkins and Dr. Carla Narowski. We remain very grateful to these exceptional individuals and to all of our members and patriotic supporters, as well as the Aletta Morris McBean Charitable Trust and the William A. Obenshane Cyber and Innovation Endowment for making events such as this possible. For over 50 years, the foundation has relied on the generous support of its trustees, members, and donors to enhance and enrich the academic program and educational experience at the college by providing additional financial resources not readily available due to other defense and service-related spending priorities for a host of college priorities, including endowed chairs, conferences and symposia, faculty and student achievement awards, and capital improvements. Your contributions reinforce and sustain the prestige and excellence of the U.S. Naval War College and its mission to educate and develop leaders in the strategic and operational challenges that lie ahead. Thank you again for your unprecedented support, advocacy, and generosity for building a global network of educated leaders who are prepared and ready to tackle the challenges of today and tomorrow. Before I turn the mic over to Chairman Bilden, I want to take a moment to let you know about the Foundation's Patriots Auction that opened yesterday, June 14th at 10 a.m. and will remain open through tomorrow, Wednesday, June 16th, until 6 p.m. We've had a lot of fun with event auctions in the past, and we hope that you will compete for some wonderful Naval War College memorabilia, autographed to first editions, and other opportunities up for bid. As always, proceeds from the auction will go to benefit priorities of greatest need at the U.S. Naval War College and foundation. Pressing forward with the program, I introduce you to our chairman, Philip Billen, who will introduce our first guest speaker. Philip. Thank you very much, George, and congratulations to you and the Naval War College Foundation staff and team for pulling together this outstanding uh, symposia today. I'm grateful to all our members who are joining. Thank you for making the time for this important presentation that anchors our series of symposia focused on emerging national security threats notably in the cyber domain involving artificial intelligence. I am pleased to report that your Naval War College Foundation is leading from the front in this strategic initiative to build awareness for the challenge posed by artificial intelligence. We are honored to have our esteemed moderator, the Honorable Bob Work, and our outstanding faculty, Dr. Chris Demchek and Captain Michael O'Hara, joining us today to address a rapidly evolving national security challenge. And before I introduce Secretary Work, allow me to comment on why the Naval War College is focused on this topic and convening this symposia for the next several weeks and months into the year. Whether it is artificial intelligence, cyber, or the Arctic, 
The Naval War College Foundation supports the most important national security priorities of our Department of Defense, critical to the professional education of our senior officers at the Naval War College. Unlike government funding, the funding from the foundation is at the speed of relevance. And as an independent 501c3, our foundation is well positioned to accelerate funding years before it is appropriated through government and DOD channels, if the funds come at all. Our foundation does not stop working during government shutdowns or national pandemics. We provide reliable and forward-looking funding for the margin of excellence at the Naval War College that government does not and oftentimes cannot provide. So Naval War College Foundation has led from the front before at the speed of relevance, notably in cybersecurity education. Years before the word cyber was part of the national dialogue, we stood up the Naval War College Foundation Cyber Task Force to build public awareness of the threat posed by cybersecurity. We convened a series of forums and supported war game simulations at the Naval War College with civilian and military leaders and our esteemed faculty. This multi-year process allowed the Naval War College Foundation to raise public awareness and philanthropic funding to prepare our Naval War College future leaders to operate on air, land, sea, and space in the strategic context of the cyber domain. Anchored by a $10 million commitment and with the generous support of our Board of Trustees, the Naval War College Foundation established funding for the Admiral James R. Hogg Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute. Today, your Naval War College Foundation is moving out again at flank speed to build awareness and funding for another rapidly evolving national security threat, artificial intelligence. Now you are not alone if you have heard much discussion about AI, but do not understand its implications in our national security or even in your daily lives. Our Naval War College faculty have noted that AI is surrounded by much hype and public misunderstanding but it is potentially existential to our national security. So it matters and we must understand it. And this is why we're convening this AI symposia today and in future events. There are ethical implications of artificial intelligence and the risk of unethical AI by our adversaries, notably China, in strategic competition with the United States. Our Naval War College professors are addressing the challenge also of how to teach our future leaders what they need to know to operate in an AI environment. Well, I am now honored to introduce Secretary Robert O'Work as our distinguished speaker and moderator on this topic. Secretary Work has a very distinguished career in public service to the nation, both in uniform for 27 years as a Marine Corps officer and at our highest level of civilian leadership of the Department of Defense, where he served as the Under Secretary of the Navy and later as the 32nd Deputy Secretary of Defense. Secretary Work served three U.S. presidents and was instrumental in developing our national strategy known as the Third Offset Strategy, which aimed to restore U.S. conventional overmatch over strategic rivals and adversaries. Secretary Work is the recipient of numerous public service awards including DOD's Distinguished Public Service Award, which he received twice, the National Intelligence Distinguished Public Service Award, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Distinguished Joint Civilian Service Award. Bob is a straight-talking Marine and a clear strategic thinker who has devoted his time and talent to national security policy, even since serving in the Pentagon. He's written extensively and spoken on a range of security challenges at prominent think tanks, and served on prestigious government commissions, including the most recently um, held position as vice chairman of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, which you'll hear more about today. I personally have had the privilege of serving with Secretary Work on the Chief of Naval Operations Executive Panel and the U.S. Naval Institute Board of Directors, which he leads as chairman. I assure you he lives up to his surname. He is one of the most hardest working men that you'll find in Washington, D.C., and we're honored to have him here today to commence our AI series. Bob, thank you very much for taking us on, and we look forward to your briefing. 
Over to you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Philip, for that overly kind introduction. And good afternoon to everyone who is watching. Thank you for joining us on this first of three events on artificial intelligence. As Philip said, the Department of Defense is really focused on artificial intelligence right now. It has been named the number one research and development priority. And the Congress established a National Security Commission on AI to consider all of the applications and how we need to prepare ourselves for this coming AI era. What I want to do this afternoon is try to convince you why you should care about AI. It's really an arcane subject. There's a lot of hype, a lot of misunderstanding. So what I want to try to do this afternoon is explain to you why the Department of Defense is so focused on this technology and why Congress now is also. Now, there are many definitions for AI, which is one of the problems that we have. And Mike O'Hare is going to discuss this in an upcoming segment. He's going to actually give you a couple different definitions. But as I will use it in this brief, AI is defined as the following. Technologies, excuse me, that solve tasks requiring human-like perception, cognition, planning, learning, communication, or physical action, and technologies that may learn and act autonomously, whether in the form of software agents or embodied robots. I think you'll get that as we step through the brief. Now, my agenda is going to take you through the, a learning path that I took myself. I want to talk first about a military technical revolution that the Department of Defense started to say, okay, how is this going to change the way we should organize, train, and equip ourselves. The second part is, okay, our competitors have now reached a point where they have rough technical parity with us in this revolution. And that is the definition of a mature revolutionary regime. And the third offset strategy that Philip Billen talked about was, what do we do about that? And then the third part is AI as a key component of a global technology competition with an existential outcome. I mean, it is very, very important that the U.S. win this competition. Now, the first ingredient of the uh, guided, I mean, the first ingredient of the revolution in war was guided munitions warfare. And this one slide seem, tries to capture what it's all about. The blue line on the slide is the circular error probable of munitions that are dropped from aircraft. Circular error probable, many of you might know, but for those of you who don't, it's a statistical uh, measure in which 50% of all of the missiles or bombs or shots at a particular target fall within a circle of the radius. The CEP is established in either feet or meters. It is a radius. And as you can see, in 1945, U.S. bombers over Germany were dropping bombs with a CEP of 3,300 feet. So I just want you to think about that for a second. We put 1,000 bombers over Schweinfurt. Each of the bombers dropped 10 500-pound bombs. So we were raining 10,000 bombs down upon Schweinfurt. Only 50% of them, 5,000, will fall within 3,300 feet of the target. The other 50% fall beyond 3,300 feet. So that's why um, collateral damage was just an accepted fact. Most unguided munitions miss their targets, and the miss distance rises over range. Now, things started to change after World War II. We had radar bombing, a uh, radar-guided bombing. Then we started to get a uh, um, precision guided munitions with laser uh, guidance, electro optical guidance. Circular or probable fell dramatically uh, down uh, during the Vietnam War, in which 28,000 guided munitions were dropped. Now, in Gulf War, in the Gulf War, only 9% of all the weapons dropped were guided, but the CEP had fallen to less than 300 feet for gravity bombs and it was within feet or uh, yards on the precision-guided bombs. 
By Bosnia, 69% of everything we uh, dropped was guided. We're using GPS at that time, and now the gravity weapon, CEP, falls to 90 feet with all of the improvements. And now, as you can see, CEP is approaching zero. Um, GPS bombs on an F-15, F-16 are going to fall within 45 feet. And the red line is the percentage of guided munitions that we now use in a campaign, and it is approaching 100%. So we have this new paradigm, accuracy and independent of range. A Tomahawk cruise missile will is as accurate at 1,000 nautical miles as it is at 100. And because it is so accurate, the warhead size doesn't have to be as large as you might imagine. As the one uh, little chart shows on the right-hand side, if you are have a CEP of 100 feet, you're going to need a 10,000-pound warhead to achieve effects on target. But if you get down to one foot, then you need less than a 10-pound warhead to achieve the same effects on a semi-hardened target. Now, ingredient two in the guided munitions battle network revolution is a battle network. The first modern manifestation was the British Homeland Air Defense Network, called the Doubting System, after Air Marshal Doubting, who was the head of uh, RAF Fighter Command. It included four grids, and these are canonical grids that are a part of every single battle network sense. You have to have a sensor grid to sense the environment. You, In that case, you had chain home radars and royal observers, royal air observers. Then you have to have a command control communications intelligence grid to make sense of what you are seeing in the battlefield. So that is the sense-making part, or what John Boyd referred to as orientation. And there was this enormously complicated and sophisticated command and control and communications grid in uh, England. The effects grid is how you apply effects in the battlefield, in this case, air interceptors, barrage balloons, anti-aircraft guns, and searchlights. And then you have a sustainment and regeneration grid that keeps the grid going, even in the midst of a hard campaign. What I showed you here is the red line is single seat fighter production for fighter command, RAF fighter command, and the black line or the uh, blue line is the Luftwaffe. So as you can see, the RAF was much better at regenerating combat losses uh, than the Luftwaffe was. And it was because their sustainment and regeneration grid was so much better. Now battle network operations revolve around what they called in World War II, doubting called the common recognized operational picture. We often refer to it as the COP, the common operational picture. But the recognized is very important because it is the commander who says, this is the operating picture that I recognize. And I expect the entire force to sync up on my recognized operation picture. In this case, it came out of the filter center at Bentley Priori. It went to all of the different groups and observers and radar units, group operations centers. And why this crop is so important is it makes commander's intent immediately more understandable throughout the force. And it allows decentralized but synchronized action. Even if you lose communications, if you understand the commander's crop, then you can operate consistently with how the commander would operate if he was giving direct orders to you. So it was the combination of guided munitions and battle networks that led to a revolution in war. William Perry, who was the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering at the, uh, uh, at the end of the 1970s, said, look, this is what we're going to be able to do. We're going to be able to see all high-value targets on the battlefield at any time. We're going to be able to make a direct hit on any target we can see because we're firing guided munitions, and we're going to be able to destroy any target we can hit. He told DARPA, I want you to make a demonstration to prove this. We created the Pave Mover Radar System, which was a ground-moving target indicator system, put it on an F-111. The F-111 would search deep behind the forward line of troops, or the FIBA at the time, the forward edge of the battle area. And it would look for groups of targets, groups of armored targets. 
it would send that information to a data processing infusion center, which would uh, make sense of the data, fire it to a surface launcher, in this case, an Army ATACMS missile. The ATACMS missile would fire a, a bus out over the group, which would release terminally guided submunitions. The submunitions at the time we were working on were called BAT, Brilliant Anti Armor uh, Technology. And they would use uh, different technologies to pick out specific targets in the target group. And this <clears throat> demonstration proved that if you put these two together, guided munitions and battle networks, you could look deep, you could shoot deep, and you could kill deep. And this really shook the Soviet general staff. By 1984, uh, they concluded that the reconnaissance strike complex, which is the way the Russians refer to as a battle network, would achieve battlefield effects equivalent to tactical nuclear weapons. You wouldn't have the fallout. You wouldn't have a lot of the bad things uh, associated with nuclear weapons, but you'd be able to kill targets like you were dropping 25 kiloton nukes. Now, luckily, we never had to test this out against the Soviets. So an Operation Desert Storm was where we started to demonstrate to the world what this all meant. In revolutionary war theory, it's called a defining battle. It gives everybody a sense of what the hell is going on. So that was the guided, munition, the guided munitions battle network revolution. And what would happen when the bad guys or our adversaries got as good in that type of warfare as we did? What would that battlefield look like? And you often hear anti-access area denial. All that is is shorthand for the adversary has, is as good in guided munitions, battle network warfare as the United States. They can look deep, shoot deep, and kill deep. And what does that mean for the joint force? Uh, well, what, you're do what we're doing is we're moving into a new era of systems warfare and algorithmic warfare. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, systems and al algorithmic warfare render combined arms warfare subordinate, not obsolete. We will continue to do combined arms warfare. But if you go up against an adversary with a guided munitions battle network, you can be the best combined arms warfare uh, force in the world, and you're going to get your clock cleaned. Um, it's not obsolete. You're still going to use combined arms warfare in many, many different cases. But against our high-end competitors, uh, it's not going to be good enough. And that's what the third offset strategy was all about. So we gain a first mover advantage in this guided munitions network. The only other credible competitor was the Soviet Union. It imploded. The U.S. is now alone on the field. So you have all these regional armies like Iraq. They're stuck in the unguided weapons regime. They're taught in combined ar they're taught to fight combined arms warfare under the Soviet model. And they were essentially reduced to a collection of targets. Moreover, the sheer scale of our advantage was difficult for any regional power to duplicate. So, like anything, they say, how do we keep from getting the snot pounded out of us? So they first go underground, they start to practice cover, concealment, and deception, and they go mobile, shoot and scoop tactics. And those can get you a long way. But those that pursued, those that could, said, we don't want a U.S. battle network assembled over our country, so we're going to pursue nuclear weapons to deter that. So Iraq and North Korea both took that route. Meanwhile, China and Russia said there's no way we're going to allow this asymmetry to stand. We're going to compete directly to, uh, with the U.S. So from 1993 to 2001, the Office of Net Assessment under the late, great Andrew Marshall, who was the director, sp sponsored a series of war games in which he called it 20XX. And he said, sometime in the 2000s, let's not argue about whether it's 2010, 2030, 2020. That's why he called it 20XX. Russia and China are most likely going to achieve technological parity with the United States in this new revolutionary regime. And when all of the players essentially uh, are can fight in the new regime equally, that's the definition of a mature revolutionary regime. 
Now, the Chinese started to think about this and the Russians, too. I mean, and they said, look, what this is going to be about is a collision of battle networks. It is truly going to be an era of systems warfare where our operational system, or excuse me, our battle network is going to go up against the Chinese operational system. That's what they refer to them as, or a reconnaissance strike complex, which is what the Russians refer to them as. And it's going to be this collision of battle networks, which the Chinese refer to as systems confrontation. <clears throat> this slide is a picture from a Soviet manual in the late 1980s. And the guided munitions battle network revolution had uh, matured on the seas between the U.S. Navy and the Soviet Union. They both had a reconnaissance strike complex. The Americans based around uh, carrier battle groups and the Soviets based around land-based, long-range maritime air and missiles. So this just gives you an idea of how our uh, potential opponents are thinking. This is a quote from CMC Order 1 in 2020. This is the first order issued by the Combined Military Commission in China signed by President Xi, and it says all training is going to emphasize systems confrontation rather than attritionistic warfare. And the reason why the Chinese say this is what got them thinking about this was Operation Allied Force, the air operation over Yugoslavia in 1999. The Chinese noticed that after the end of the air campaign, which was quite intensive, the Serbian army just drove, drove home. They were still intact. They had not been attrited very much at all. And the Chinese started thinking, well, in this war, then, we need to stop thinking about killing specific tanks or individual aircraft or individual ships. What we really need to be thinking is about how we kill the system. And that is now their theory of victory. It's called system destruction warfare. And this is a quote from the Chinese military manuals. You know, it's no longer centered on the annihilation of enemy forces. They don't care about the air exchange ratio over the Taiwan Straits as much as they care about disrupting, paralyzing, or destroying the operational capability of the enemy's battle network. They believe if they can do that, there's no way that the U.S. Joint Force would be able to accomplish its campaign objectives. So that's what the third offset strategy was all about. What would it take to win in a systems confrontation against an adversary with rough technological parity and who was making system destruction attacks? And of the several ways considered the Defense Science Board, which I ask as the Deputy Secretary, tell me what is the most important technology for us to be able to regain our overmatch over potential adversaries who have technical parity with us. And this is what they told me. Look, it's difficult to quantify. We're not going to be able to do this scientifically. But we believe that autonomy, fueled by advances in artificial intelligence, has attained a tipping point in value. So this is the place where you have to take immediate action. And they convinced me. Uh, we had looked at quantum, we had looked at uh, 5G, we had looked at AI, we had looked at a lot of different things. But the DSB said, this is the thing you have, to, you have to excel at. If you can excel at this, then you have a chance of overmatching an opponent. So let me just talk about autonomy and the way we thought about it. We had different levels. The first one is command autonomy, and that's at the battle network level, the system level. And this is the definition from the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory Command and Control Directorate. It's not a technology. It's a command and control approach that seeks to push power and decision making to the warfighting edge and the capability of an individual element in the force to operate without communications to a command authority. Now, it works best when that delegated unit has the crop and the commander's intent. And that's all they need. Just think about a command and control system with thin line, uh, thin line communications 
that just send out the crop and the commander's intent. And if you train your force in command autonomy, you're going to be able to have a force that can operate in a synchronized manner even when it doesn't have uh, full-time communications with higher authority. Now, the, you know, we were talking about this and somebody said, well, give me a damn example of this. And we said, uh, U.S. Navy attack submarine. They're given an order, go to a specific area. This is your water space. Kill any bad guy in that water space you find. You never talk with them. The commander is totally on his own or her own. That is total command autonomy. We trust our people to execute the mission as designed. So that's one way that you fight back against system destruction attacks. You train your force in command autonomy and you rely upon initiative and you know the delegated commander's judgment. Now delegated autonomous uh, autonomy is what you say, okay, SSN, this is what you have. You can exercise self-government and self-directed behavior. And what that means is they can develop courses of action to achieve a higher level mission objective, and they can choose among them. This is a big thing. A lot of people say, ooh, AI, it's allowing uh, machines to make decisions. I don't think of the machines as making decisions, as making choices. Making choices to accomplish a specific mission objective assigned to them by a human commander. There's a big, big difference uh, between making decisions and making choices among courses of action. And delegated machine autonom autonomy is the level of independence you're willing to grant an intelligent system or machine to execute a task. So the reason why I wanted to uh, talk about this is autonomy is not AI. But AI in various forms and in varying, varying proportions, that is the critical technology, technological enabler. And the way the DSB said it is, the intellectual foundation for autonomy stems from AI. So AI was just viewed as a technological means to a desired operational way, getting to autonomy in your battle networks. And that was the conceptual foundation for the third offset strategy. We wanted to use autonomy to improve sense, sensing. We wanted to use autonomy to improve sense making, be able to make sense of all of the data that's coming in from the battlefield. That would allow you to make faster, more relevant decisions, would then drive a higher battle network operational tempo, John Boyd's OODA loop. And we believe that that would give us a sustained advantage in looking deep, shooting deep, and killing deep. And it was also viewed as the primary means to survive system destruction attacks. Now, we, uh, of course, we were saying there's going to be a lot more intelligent systems and machines in the battle network. This is what we're shooting for. This is what we want. It's going to be able to apply AI to a particular problem or domain, a defined knowledge base. Again, these are not independent actors just trying to decide what they're going to do on the battlefield. They're given a specific task or mission by a human commander, and the human commander gives them a proxy for action. And so we always conserve, sometimes you'll hear the term artificial narrow intelligence and artificial general intelligence. Artificial general intelligence is generally viewed as an AI that truly can mimic human intelligence and behavior. It would be difficult for you to be communicating with an AGI, and you wouldn't know whether it was a human or a machine. But that's not what we were thinking of, because this is you always have a human command and control system. Everything operating on the battlefield is operating under that human command and control system. So again, a human assigns a mission to the machine, delegates the machine a proxy, a proxy for action. They can create their own courses of action to accomplish the mission assigned by a human, choose among those, and then execute the task. Now envision this is coming in two different forms. One we refer to as autonomy at rest. These are software agents. These are the agents that do computer vision and can search through 
hours and hours and hours of full motion video and pick out patterns that human analysts won't be able to pick out. It's going to be predictive maintenance systems. It's going to be predictive indications and warning systems. It's going to be expert advisory systems. And the key aim of these autonomy at rest is really to improve. They're doing a lot of things, but the payoff in battle is improving the sense making, which is the second O in the OODA loop. And that is what John Boyd considered to be the most important part of the OODA loop. The commander understanding what's happening on the battlefield and being able to build a recognized operational picture that he or she wants the entire force synced up on. And because all of these things were designed to help humans make better decisions, it described autonomy at rest in terms of human machine collaboration. Now, what the slide on, I mean, what the picture on the right shows is a DARPA project called Deep Green that was tried in the early aughts. The commander is in the middle. The commander has a pad and he sketches, he or she sketches options and lists out potentially second order effects. You give it to the AI. The AI takes a look at these different options and says, look, based on the best battlefield intelligence we have right now, this is the option that we believe, I'm, I'm talking as though the machines are humans, I apologize. Um, this is the option we recommend to you that you pursue. Comes back to the commander. The commander then does sketch to plan. So this is like a figure eight. You go to the right, you come back to the commander, and now the commander sketches to plan. He also has um, natural language processing, so he's talking to the tablet. This is what I hope to accomplish. This is what I want to do. This is how I would expect the enemy to react. The AI then takes it and puts it into Blitzkrieg, which is a fast multi-resolution combat model, and it generates a portfolio of possible futures. These possible futures are then put into a secondary AI called Crystal Ball, and it has all the most recent intel and information, blue, green, and red, and Crystal Ball says, okay, of all these possible futures, this is the one that looks as though it is most advantageous. The commander would consider that, choose the right, uh, uh, or choose the uh, plan that he or she wants, and then these would be sent out to the force. Once again, the commander is at the center of this thing. The AI is simply helping the commander uh, make better, faster, more relevant decisions. So it's not as though the third offset strategy saw a whole bunch of AIs running around making decisions on the battlefield. Everything the AIs were doing was in support of a human commander or operator. Now, the reason why I show Deep Green is we didn't have the technology to make it work in the early aughts. So DARPA shelved it. But the Chinese believe we actually have Deep Green. They write about it all the time. And they're trying to develop their own Deep Green. So, you know, different types of command decision uh, models, these are going to come in the future and are really going to make a difference. Now, the second type of autonomy, of course, is autonomy in motion. I think most of you can intuitively grasp what that's all about. It's robots, unmanned weapons, unmanned systems. But again, because we conceived of these as working hand in hand with humans to solve a complex battlefield problem, it referred to autonomy in motion in terms of human machine combat teaming. Now, for some specific missions, there would be machine to machine combat teaming. Um, again, I'm going to talk as though these things are humans. I apologize. DARPA has a project called CODE. It's collaborative weapon attacks. Imagine seven missiles coming in to attack an integrated air defense system. One missile goes high and tells the missile's buddies, I'm going to turn on my active radar. You guys maintain radar silence. 
One of the missiles says, I'm going to swing to the east, and I'm going to do a diving attack. And a second missile says, I'm going to swing to the west, and I'm going to come in on a sea skimming attack to divide the radar, uh, I mean, to make the radar problem more difficult. Another one of the missiles says, I'm going to start electronic jamming. And together, they operate to overwhelm the enemy system. We're doing this now. We're getting better at it. Within 10 years, I think this is going to be the standard practice. And then the next step will be combat swarms. And these will be made with low-cost effectors uh, that swarm like a bee swarm and overwhelm an enemy's defenses. These are coming without question. Uh, we're right on the cusp of them. So think of autonomy in motion as all of the unmanned system stuff and autonomy at rest as all of the planning stuff. Now, there was never any expectation that these systems would always make the right choice. As long as they made the choices faster than, as well, faster, and as well as or better than humans, we would take that. Um, the exemplar was the intelligence community experience with computer vision. Up until 2015, a human analyst was better at picking out objects in a field of view than a machine. But in 2015, the machine became better at the, than the human. And as soon as that happened, the intelligence community started to go after computer vision in a big, big way. They called it AIM, Augmented Intelligence with Machines. Why have a human stare at a screen for hours on end? The machine can do that without getting bored, is uh, as good or better than the human. And so the same thing's going to happen when we do experiments which show that machine intelligence makes choices as well as or better than humans, then you're going to go with that type of uh, capability. But they're never going to make the right choice. There was a study in Afghanistan. We studied a whole bunch of different engagements in which there was either a blue-on-blue -blue engagement, fratricide, a blue-on-green engagement where we engaged a friendly unit. <coughs> and uh, an engagement where we accidentally killed non-combatants. And the study was, what was the mistake? What was the major mistake? And in 50% of the cases, it was due to target misidentifications. Every one of these misidentifications were made by human operators. They had as much intelligence as they could sometimes real-time data feeds, and they made the wrong call. It was not an enemy. It was either a blue unit, a friendly unit, an allied unit, or a non-combatant. There is no future that I can imagine where machine intelligence won't do as well as or better than humans in that type of environment. They're not scared. They don't, you know, they are just making choices based on their programming. And as long as we test it, validate it, verify it, uh, and monitor it on the battlefield, then there's every expectation that they're going to be able to operate in accordance with international humanitarian law. So the third offset said, okay, you have these four grids. And what you're going to start doing is injecting a whole bunch of artificial narrow intelligence, autonomy at rest, and autonomy in motion capabilities in all of the grids. And you're going to have widespread use of machine-to-machine -machine communications. And at some tipping point, we would <coughs> notice this through experimentation, the whole battle network starts to operate differently. And we refer to this as a human-machine collaborative battle network, and you can see what we expected to happen. More rapid, more rapid, more rapid, more rapid, more rapid, more rapid. And this would be the physical manifestation of what we conceived of as algorithmic warfare. Now, the Chinese think about this too, and this is what they, this is their definition for algorithmic warfare. They call it intelligentized combat operations. So you use artificial intelligence as the core, 
You have technical support from info networks, your battle network, your operational system. You have big data. You have cloud computing, the Internet of Things, and intelligence control. And everything seems to be operating in an intelligent way. This is what the Chinese military believes will allow them to leapfrog the U.S. Joint Force and become the best military on the planet. We don't want that future, and we need to get there before them. And if we're in a you know, near technological parity, we would like to have an advantage in some way. So this truly is an existential competition for the Joint Force. Because we don't want to go up against an adversary who has really solved this, and we haven't. So that's the DOD story. Meanwhile, Congress is watching DOD and saying, look, we need to have a commission on our AI, and we want this commission to take a look at all these technologies and address the national security and defense needs of the United States. And that's what the commission has been doing for the last two years. Now, AI is not a single technology. It, we refer to it as an AI stack. You have to have hardware on which the algorithms run. You have to have data to feed the algorithms. Then you create applications for a specific mission need. You integrate all of these things, and you have to have the talent to do all of that. <clears throat> The commission assessed that China was leading in data applications and integration, and the U.S. was leading in hardware algorithms and talent. So it's a 3-3 tie. This is a competition that is very, very close uh, being hard fought. And as you can see up in the upper right, the victor of this competition is going to get a $13 trillion economic driver. Now, China is the first competitor since World War II that has the wherewithal to supplant us as the global technological leader and innovation hub, which is the very foundation of our economic competitiveness and our military technical superiority. They have the strategic intent, they have the plans, and they have the resources to try. <clears throat> They're in this competition to win it, and we are not yet in it. There are five threats that we really worried about that are going to become more central in this coming AI era. All of the attacks on us, uh, I refer to them as societal and governance cohesion attacks. Authoritarian regimes look for fissures in democracies and try to widen the fissures and deepen them and either burst the society apart or make us ineffective in governance. The attacks that have up to this point have been generally human-directed attacks done with bots. Imagine what would happen if you had an AI algorithm that was designed to power these. This would be a problem that is really going to uh, be hard to solve. The second threat is <clears throat> AI is allowing data harvesting and micro-targeting of individuals, which is going to help find the fissures in a, a society, and again, widen them and deepen them. Accelerated cyber attacks. Again, the cyber attacks right now have been done by humans, uh, you know, essentially pushing out cyber tools. Uh, if you had a AI-enabled cyber attack that could really move quickly and go around defenses, that is really going to be difficult to stop. Adversarial AI is the bad guy coming after our AI and corrupting it or making it uh, uh, incapable of accomplishing its task. And then the other thing that really scares us is AI-enabled biotechnologies in which new viruses and pathogens are created, which could really cause a problem. So as Philip said, this truly is an existential competition, and it has enormous implications for our economic competitiveness and national security. Every single American citizen should be worried about this competition and thinking about, okay, 
what are ways in which the U.S. will be able to win this competition over time? Now, there are four ways we can get after this. The first one is leadership. Uh, we recommended establishing a technology competitive council uh, modeled after the National Security Council, which led us through the long-term strategic competition of the Cold War. It would have to be in the White House. We recommended it a report to the vice president, and it would make our national technology, technology strategies. As far as talent, we don't have enough talent, either in the DOD or in the federal government. And there were a whole lot of different ideas on how we thought we could create talent. I mean, get talent into the government. A lot of people say, oh, people are never going to go into the government. They're not going to get paid as much as if they worked at Google. But that misses the point. When we talk with the young people uh, during the course of this, they were less worried about the salary they were going to get when they uh, graduated. They were more worried about the civilian, I mean, the debt that they would have when they graduate. So our recommendation, our strategy for building talent focused on getting talent and uh, where people weren't burdened with crushing debt. We definitely have a lead in hardware. We have a two-generation lead, we believe, but we're 100 miles away. TMSC is the world's leader in this. They're on Taiwan. And if China was able to forcibly incorporate Taiwan, they would get all of that um, IP and capability. So we think we need to have our own domestic fabrication facility. That will be an expensive proposition, maybe $40 billion. And innovation really is, this is a competition that is expensive, and you're going to have to pay for it. So we had all sorts of different ideas on how to spend money. And if you combine these three things, leadership from the top, talent throughout the government, maintain your hard work uh, lead, and spend more money on research and development, you would have a better than even chance of winning the competition. Partnerships went across all four of these with our allies and responsible AI. And it's important for everyone to realize that this is an economic competition. It is a military technical competition and it's a values competition. The hardware that is deployed by governments will reflect the values of the governments that are deploying them. All we have to do is look at 5G and know that the Chinese developed their infrastructure in 5G to allow all that data to be uh, exfilled back to China. And we know how China's going to use AI. They're going to use it for population surveillance, for minority suppression. They don't care about privacy, civil liberties, or civil rights. So we don't want a world in which Chinese hardware in, in AI, in quantum, in 5G, in additive manufacturing, in biotechnology, we don't want a world in which the Chinese are really setting the, uh, setting the goals and the standards. That is a world that is safe for authoritarianism, and it's not a world in which Americans or democratic nations should aspire to have. So why should you care about AI? It is the key to U.S. economic competitiveness and national security in the 21st century. China is intent on becoming the global AI superpower by 2030. They are spending a bundle of money. They have national plans and they are absolutely committed to surpassing the United States. So it is definitely time for us to cowboy up and meet this challenge. I really appreciate, uh, <clears throat> I really appreciate being invited by the Naval War College Foundation this afternoon. As you can tell, I'm very passionate about this subject, and it is something that I believe that the United States just absolutely has to um, be serious about and dominate in the 21st century. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Secretary Work, thank you, sir, for your thoughtful and engaging remarks. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes remaining for questions and answers, and, and I'm happy to relay them to you from our guests uh, as time permits. 
Uh, the first question is from Jeffrey Gage. How do we defend against geopolitical, cultural, doctrinal, and other bias in artificial intelligence? Well, I actually think either Mike or Chris, as you see their uh, presentations, uh, they might be better. Uh, in fact, they might even talk about this in their presentations. But uh, let me just say that the first thing you have to do is worry about bias in your data. And so you really start to look through your data because those will feed your machine learning algorithms. And you want to make sure to the greatest extent possible that you uh, remove bias in data. Then bias in the uh, algorithms themselves. This is one of the key research uh, aims going on right now in AI. <clears throat> how do you tackle um, this problem and how do you solve it? And there is a lot of optimism that AI is going, AI itself is going to allow us to go after these biases. Um, all I can say right now is explainability, understanding, you know, uh, especially for neural networks, which uh, Mike and uh, Chris uh, are going to talk about, and uh, machine deep learning uh, algorithms. It's not always apparent how the machine comes to the choice that it made. <clears throat> so explainability and bias are two of the areas where we are spending a lot of money right now on trying to solve both of those problems. Uh, and then I'm going to defer to Chris and Mike uh, because I think they are probably have some great ideas on how we would do this too. Thank you, sir. Uh, the, next, the next question comes from Professor Joshua Meeks. Um, how do you address the issue of proliferation, particularly with non-state actors having much easier access to AI than something like nuclear weapons. Well, <clears throat> this is exactly right. On export controls, for example, the National Security Commission said, there's no way you're ever going to have export controls on algorithms. They're simply, you know, they're created in the open, they're out in the wild, they proliferate rapidly throughout the globe, and you are going to have these type of algorithms readily available, and uh, it's going to be a challenge. The one place where you can have export controls is on hardware. Um, and so that's one of the strategies to try to keep, uh, try to keep non-state actors uh, from getting their hands on hardware, which would allow them to make uh, AI applications or applications at scale. But this is going to be, yeah, this without question, you're not going to stop the proliferation of AI algorithms. Uh, it's going to be so ubiquitous that bad guys, just like on the internet, bad guys will use algorithms for bad things. Secretary Work, thank you again for taking time out of your very busy schedule to spend it with us this afternoon. You are a true patriot and friend of the foundation, and we are grateful for your continued leadership and support and look forward to, to you joining us again in the, in the future to carry on this discussion on a very complex topic. Thanks a lot, George. Ladies and gentlemen, time did not permit us to get to all of your thoughtful questions, and there were, there were quite a few. So, but I am happy to say that today's guest speakers have offered to send you an email response in the coming days regarding your submitted questions. It is time now for a short break. We will commence the second half of our presentation shortly after a message uh, from our uh, foundation, from the Naval War College Foundation's Vice Chairman and Treasurer, Dan Holland. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Work, for that incredibly informative and sobering overview of artificial intelligence and the strategic importance of AI to our national security. We're all fortunate to live in the most innovative economy in the world. And I have no doubt that we will prevail over our competitors in this domain as we have historically in all others. I'm Dan Holland and I'm the vice chairman and treasurer of the Naval War College Foundation. 
And on behalf of all of us, I want to extend my sincere welcome to you for joining us today. Welcome to our members, and I particularly want to welcome those of you who are joining our events for the first time. As you heard earlier, today's symposium is part of a series on this important topic of artificial intelligence and its impact on our national defense. We hope that many of you will be able to join us for future events. I also want to thank some of our sponsors who made today's event possible. Captain David and Mrs. Paula Hunter, Chairman Philip and Mrs. Patricia Bilden, Trustee Emeritus Richard and Barbara Rosenberg, Trustee Paul and Mrs. Ingrid Dimitrik, Trustee Scott and Mrs. Alicia DePasquale, Trustee Waring and Mrs. Carmen Partridge, Chairman Emeritus William and Mrs. Penny Obenshane, Trustee Emeritus Hope Van Buren, Captain George and Dr. Wendy Lang. Like all nonprofits, we rely on the generosity of our donors to enable us to fulfill our mission of providing the Naval War College with the funding necessary to train our next generation of leaders to help sustain our national competitive advantages around the world and to maintain the peace that enables global commerce. Enhancing the understanding of artificial intelligence and machine learning and adapting those technologies to our national defense is one of the program funding priorities of the Naval War College Foundation. We work with senior leaders in the US Navy and the Department of Defense to help identify areas that help advance broader strategic objectives critical to our national security. Cyber is another important programming priority for the foundation and for the country. We hope that you enjoy today's program. And if you're interested in learning more about the Naval War College Foundation and our programs, we look forward to hearing from you. I'm now gonna turn it back over to our CEO, Captain George Lang, to introduce our panel for the next part of the program. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my privilege to introduce you to our second guest speaker, Dr. Chris Demchek, a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army and professor in the Strategic and Operational Research Department at the US Naval War College. With engineering, economics, comparative complex organization theory and political science degrees, Dr. Chris Demchek is the Rear Admiral Grace M. Hopper 
professor of cybersecurity and a member of the Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute at the US Naval War College. In her research on cyberspace as a globally shared, insecure, complex substrate, Dr. Demchek takes a systemic approach to emergent structures, comparative institutional evolution, adversaries, use of systemic cyber tools, virtual worlds and gaming for operationalized organizational learning, and designing systemic resilience against imposed surprise. She is considered an expert in many areas, including civil military relations, cyber warfare, economics, geopolitics, information operations, international relations, and wargaming. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Chris Demchek. Thank you very, very much for this opportunity and thank you everyone for um, attending these seminars. Um, I've, I have a tough job. I'm coming after secretary work, but I hope I can make a, one or two arguments that um, at least expand upon his argument. Now, the first thing I want to talk about today is, I, as, as Secretary Work already said, it's already integrated uh, in our lives, um, in our threats, and, and certainly in our future. And I'm going to make um, three arguments today. I'm, I'm going to point out how AI is cyber's offspring, uh, as I refer to it. Um, it comes from the same poorly secured, shoddy substrate of cyberspace. And you have the same problems in AI today, the same challenges um, in the models and in the transparency of those models um, as you would expect an offspring of cyber. That means it uh, gives a lot of adversary opportunities. And I'm going to make an argument today that um, China does indeed have um, a slim lead and you know, what three of what I call the four horsemen of AI, and the scale, coherence, and foreknowledge but we still have one that's a pretty unique capability, and that's the speed at which we're willing to share um, with each other uh, in development and in sort of common values. And finally, uh, I'm going to put together what I, I hope is a call to action about awareness um, and action and allies um, that we don't have a choice. We have to counter the leads that the Chinese have. And for that, I'm going to hopefully set you up so that you are ready for the uh, amazing talk that's gonna come by my colleague, uh, Captain Mike O'Hara afterwards. So let's move on, let's begin. Well, uh, one of the interesting things about artificial intelligence that if you like I were around in the 1990s that you're you're beginning to see the same sort of level of promise that we had when we had the first internet that um, artificial intelligence was going to solve so many problems to make the world a better place. And, um, and block, for example, you have blockchain, artificial intelligence, you have all the hype you could possibly have. And of course, what we got was nothing like what they promised. And that's also turning out to be true that the adversaries are keeping pace and they're certainly using it against us in all of our systems. Now, the AI that you know of up till now, if you've been around for a while, is not exactly the same AI that it was when, when uh, the last 50 years, let's say. So we had a dominant form of artificial intelligence called symbolic intelligence that peaked somewhere around the 1980s. And that is the AI that people know of, of having you know, what they call cycles of, of spring and then winter, great popularity and then great disappointment and the funding went with it all the way along. Indeed, the AI that we have today is what's called sub-symbolic AI. And it is different in a very important way that sub-symbolic AI we actually started it at a, uh, the, uh, at a lab run by ONR, the Office of Naval Research, and it was meant to mimic the brain. And so AI was meant to be designed to mimic the various activation points in the brain and it sort of it trumbled along, but at a very lower level compared to this symbolic AI until we got into the 2000s where you saw the rise of both big data and massive computing power, both of which are essential for this kind of um, artificial intelligence. And it's important to know the difference because the second kind is the kind that is dominant today, the kind that is referred to as neural nets or neural learning and deep learning. 
Now, the old AI, the symbolic AI, was, um, was written much like computer programs. It was machine readable. And here's a good example. This is the, uh, the old game of the cannibals and missionaries where you have to get all six of them across the river, a set of rules and movements of people back and forth. And you have to get them across the river without the cannibals ever outnumbering the missionaries and eating them. And one of the interesting things is when you set up this kind of artificial intelligence, which expressed itself in um, expert learning, uh, you can read what the program is doing. But the newer kind of artificial intelligence, the uh, sub-symbolic, artificial intelligence is based on mathematical layers, on matrices, and on how you, you capture the pixels or the pieces of data and you attach values to them and you filter them. And that's how you get from one end, which may look like a picture of an input, which in this case is a dog, you get through these series of layers to a classification module, which is it's basically statistics, and you then put out output confidences about whether or not that is or is not a dog. And it's important to know how this works, because when you know fundamentally how it works, you then are capable of, of um, pretty much understanding as other people talk about it and what it can and can't do. So what I'm going to take just a couple of slides to give you the quick down and dirty on it. So this is an example. We have a dog here. And what we do is we take this picture, but we don't know it's a dog. At this point, the, the, the program is simply given this picture as an input. And it takes all of the pixels and it breaks them into a set of pixels. And, and in this particular case, the filter, which is the weights in the middle, the filter activates on whether or not there are vertical edges. And that's exactly what your brain does. When your eyes see things, you have neurons that activate on vertical edges or horizontal edges or slanted edges. And then it kicks that information, if they activate, to the one behind. And that set of neurons will activate on you know, T kinds of vertical and horizontal or W kinds of, of, um, of images. So in this particular case, what you see is that the way it figures out whether it's a vertical edge or not is that it attaches numbers. And the higher the numbers, the more uh, light colored and the lower the numbers, the more dark colored. And then the bigger the difference between them will tell you whether or not there's a vertical edge. So you would expect mm -hmm. that if there's a vertical edge with that weighting um, filter right there that you would have a high number and if there isn't you'd have a low number and indeed if you look to the right you have the activation map high number says here we have a vertical edge and the low number says no nope, we don't have one there so let's look at the next example this is kind of how it's set up what happens is you get sets of pixels they move across and for them each of them they have a filter okay now let's look at what it looks like when you add vertical edges plus horizontal plus slanted edges. And here we see the, uh, the first set of layered maps, you know, the, the very edge kind of looking at an, any particular image. And the first one is vertical, the second one is horizontal, and the last one is slanted. And they then activate just like ones and zeros in a computer program, they activate and send that information back through the filter. When you get it all together, you can also add in color. And then you can add in the depth of color, and that come and, and that those are numbers, depth, height, and width. And when you put that together, you end up with a, a, a model of vertical edges collectively put together with color. And now I have this unknown input, and I keep call, I keep iterating through these pictures. And I get a more and more consolidated. And each iteration gives me another pixel, which goes into the next array, which goes into the next array. Each one has filters in between. And finally, it gets to the very end where we get the, uh, the program makes its best guess, is this a car, a truck, or a van? Now, what's important about this is when people talk about their algorithms or their models, this is what they're talking about. There is not a single thing along here that a developer doesn't specifically put together. And when they get to the end and it's meant to be a car and they guess wrong and it's a van, in a particularly prominent version of neural net learning, that's called supervised learning. The 
the training set says, nope, you got it wrong. That was supposed to be a van. And so the developer has to go back through and into those filters and tweak them in order to come up with a, an, an estimate at the end that is closer to the right answer, which is a car. So that labeled data on the far side, that training data becomes incredibly important for the, this whole model to learn how to identify, in this case, cars. Now there's a kind called unsupervised learning where you're not told what the right answer is at the end, but how will you cluster data? And so one of the big breakthroughs in 2015 was when Google's Deep Mind was given a week's worth of YouTube videos. And by the end, it had taught itself, i.e. it had automatically gone back through and iterated and changed things and iterated and changed things. It had taught itself how to recognize cats at the end. Now, this is the training model. This is the model. This is the training process. And then it goes into a testing process where you take what seems to be a successful model and you throw it at a pile of testing data. In supervised AI, it has labels. And in unsupervised, it has clusters. You throw it at the testing data. And if it gets through that, then you throw it onto the real world. So this is how it generally works. So when you look at that long model and you recognize that is the, the curated data uh, corrects it at the other end, you can also begin to see where errors can come about. For one thing, for example, the model is it makes its decisions through a series of very complex numbers of matrices and, and tweaking and, and the algorithms underneath, and it can teach itself the wrong things. And here's a good example where we have someone who was interested in identifying pictures of animals in natural environments. And what the model learned was that a blurry background meant it was a picture of an animal in, in natural environments. And when the researcher then turned the same uh, model onto the, the test data, it identified a, a mountain range as, uh, as an animal because it had a blurry background. Similarly, you um, have a situation where it'll identify something and you don't know what it's identified. And so one of the things that people have had to do is they've had to start boxing the outcome and say, computer, tell me what you're seeing. And so it would box the outcomes and then they could figure out what the, what the computer was actually attributing those confidences to. And, and I don't mean computer, I mean the model. And I, I have to be very careful with that because it's not the entire computer, it's a model and there are libraries of models and the models are designed for specific tasks. And that's an important distinction because we don't yet quite have them um, at a stage where they can just generalizably identify anything that's in front of them. Now, one of the other things you do is you send them off and you say, detect things for me. So here's a good example, detect vehicles. And then you tell it, well, no, no, what I want you to do is um, detect trucks. And it would filter for trucks. And the nice thing about this is you can see, oh, and those look like vehicles and those look like trucks. And I believe this is what Secretary Work was talking about, that this is one of the, the big, um, uh, big advances that happened roughly around the same time as DeepMind in, in 2015. But it also means that your models are learning on test data and on huge test data banks. And a couple of the biggest test beta banks were actually themselves research was done by MIT researchers. And what they discovered is they have errors in them. And they're not small errors. When I want a 98% accuracy in my model, and then I find out I've tested it on something, the 6% of the errors are already, 6% of the data that I'm going to have it learn are already wrong, or 10% in quick draw. And we're talking about big problems like light bulbs identified as a tiger and an apple la uh, labeled as t-shirt. And here's a, uh, here's a couple of other ones that are interesting. Here's a, obviously a panda, which was labeled as a vulture. Um, this is clearly Queen Elizabeth with a shower cap and 99% percentile. And here are two others. This is a lighthouse and here's a Persian cat. When you train your model on that, leaving aside the adversary, you already are going to have a problem, but the adversaries are going to use it. On you. So for example, this very lack of transparency in the model means that, you know, just like in, in the cyberspace in general, you can pull tricks on it. 
And here's one that um, you can teach facial recognition to see somebody other than you. And if you've been on YouTube, you know that you can also teach facial recognition, not even to recognize you as a human if you wear a funny t-shirt. Here's another one, change the pixel slightly so that humans can't even see the difference between the two uh, pictures. And here you have a weapon. Yes, that's an accurate answer. And over here, it says, no, no, it's a helicopter. And all you've done is change a few pixels. There's a couple other examples. Here's the images um, of what's called genetic algorithms. And it, here that it is meant to identify that as a robin and a cheetah, an armadillo, but we can't check. Humans cannot figure out what that algorithm is really saying. And maybe it is accurately saying something and what it's accurately telling you is that that's a drone, a helicopter, or a torpedo. But no, it's actually telling you it's a robin, a cheetah, or an armadillo. And this problem continues throughout the, the industry uh, in, in machine learning in particular. There was a recent talk by um, a Microsoft engineer at, in, in, in January, talked about the entire development cycle of machine learning all prone to the same problems that you see in cyberspace, you know, as it's it, the offspring of cyberspace is AI and ML, and you see the same problem showing up where the data can be corrupted by someone or just because of, of errors. You can put back doors into those development cycles. You can evade them. You can steal from them. And indeed, the other thing that Microsoft discovered is that 25 out of the 28 machine learning firms that they interviewed had no idea how to secure their systems. Well, with some sympathy, you can understand that. It is so hard to get those models to work at all. They do not want to be dealing with it. But unfortunately, there's a whole lot of machine learning attacks that can be instituted on them. And, the, and our main adversaries absolutely know all of this. So I argue, and I, I, uh, I, I echo in this regard, um, Secretary Work's comment, um, I have identified in, in, a, in a piece that there are pretty much four horsemen of AI in, in this great systems conflict that we're involved in. And the Chinese do indeed seem to have a lead in, in three of the four. And if we make them equivalent to what um, Secretary Work just said, uh, the lead in scale, of course, is data, they, they have the data, they collected the data. Um, the, he called uh, the strategic coherence that I put up there, and he called that integration. And absolutely, it's very clear where they're going and their expectations of how they will, uh, uh, how the Chinese population will become the dominant force in the, in the world in the future. And of course, there's um, foreknowledge. And I add foreknowledge because if you have all the resources and the data and you can put that together, then you can figure out what people are doing, have been doing, what capacity they have, and you know what they might be doing. And that is, of course, knowing this kind of advance. But I argue we still have the fourth one, speed. And it's very interesting because it's quite culturally unique to us. We don't mind sharing. We do it rather rapidly. We have our, our speed in, um, in our developments on the algorithms that we work with and in, of course, cooperating and in developing our talent. So we, we're not without resources on this one, but we are not at the moment develop, developing them properly. So this geopolitical reality is coming extremely fast at us. Um, China already graduates uh, more computer scientists than we do in all of STEM. Now they're getting a reverse stream of people who have learned and worked with us for 10 years and going home. And then, of course, they're laying ownership and data flows everywhere. And then most people know this, but the rise of Xi Jinping has been central to this sense of the Chinese folks that they are, they have a rightful place in the world and that they wish and intend to be the technological superpower. And of course, what that means for military power, I think um, um, Secretary Work made that very clear. It means that we seriously have to start moving fast. Right? Now, at the moment, the Chinese scale has meant they are moving out with such alacrity and such presence 
that it is extremely difficult not to stumble over them somewhere along the way. And this particular research was done by an Australian security institute, where they're simply tracking on a very real time basis where these firms are and where they have a, a lock hold and where they are both extracting data and information, which of course can be flown back and also where they are um, being, being able to um, put that together, data, information, talent, uh, and ownership um, to basically further their desires to use AI in, uh, the, in, in the competition with us. We're, we're, our world is changing so dramatically that uh, two years ago, a colleague and I could do a research on BGP hijacking in our own networks. And we could look at a map like this, very clean map. This is a map, uh, a structure of the internet. And now we have to talk about clouds. So whereas we have the ability here to study um, in 2010, what was happening when the Chinese, for example, China Telecom would put points of presence in our network. Now with the advent of commercial clouds, we have no automatic right, that is we in the government have no automatic right to know who's working in that cloud, where the data is going, what algorithms are being used, who's developing those algorithms. And those clouds are becoming, uh, are basically covering our network more and more, nor do we really know who they're letting in. This is a, a bit of the research from the, um, the hijack work we did uh, a couple of years ago, where we tracked China, um, uh, Canadian government um, traffic that was basically supposed to be sent to Korea and how it got hijacked and went through China Telecom points of presence. And it ended up wandering around China before it ended up in Korea. So it gave China um, representatives through China Telecom the opportunity to copy data. Well, that was done a couple of years ago. But what we know now is that the 23 companies have over 2,500 of these points of presence in people's networks around the world. This is an amazing scale and ability to collect data for AI or whatever you want to collect from that. The Chinese version of Baidu is all over the world and very strategically located over national capitals. Okay? So this future is coming extremely fast. This is a, a quick picture a couple of years old of the China Digital Belt and Road Initiative the BRI, and of course they are in internet cables, telecommunications equipment, internet, but here's the one I want you to pay attention to, and that's the smart cities. This is the apogee of AI expression in the commercial world, is when I can wire your entire city, watch your people, use facial recognition, do the analysis, and be right back at them through your police um, to control them as necessary, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. And this is already showing up throughout the world. And of course, that data is not just staying there, right? Um, this is the uh, international submarine cable map that we once had about only 10 years ago. Looks very clean. 99% um, or well, more like 98% of the internet travels on these ca cables, but look at it now much more complex. Every one of them comes up on somebody's sovereign territory. And now on that sovereign territory, you can use this amazing data and computing power to figure out where that traffic is going and who's doing what with it. Right? And so we're also seeing the rise of borders in cyberspace. A colleague and I call it cyber Westphalia, actually beginning to be structured around the ability to, to collect the data and what jurisdictions can be enacted using those, um, that technology. And AI, of course, is logically showing up in these places as well. But I have to point out that none of these expressions of Chinese representation is found, is, is reciprocated by allowing uh, our representation in China because of course the adversary knows very well what it's doing. Although it does demand that you hand over its technology if you want access to the Chinese market. Right? 
this is your different world. We used to have a world in which we had a sort of basic stack of hardware and, you know, then software and stuff. Now we have a world in which you have cloud computing and virtualization and all these layers, right? And we have a different stack attached to it. Now, this is where artificial intelligence is, is an offspring of cyber and it's changing the mothership at the same time, right? This is where you're going to get massive data management, which leads into uh, um, machine learning and making decisions and that we have not seen before. And it's already out there in our world. And of course, that already means the adversaries out there too. Right? Whose preferences will dominate your future if we don't figure this out? If we don't look at this new structuring of the world, how will we make decisions freely for us, for our own democracies, if we don't figure this out? And this opportunity is, is absolutely, um, absolutely at the cusp. It's right at our front doorstep. Um, if you look at GDP differences, we expected the Chinese to match us somewhere towards uh, 2030, and they initially thought it would be 2049. But if you use the uh, GDP PPP measure, right, they already matched the U.S. economy in 2014, and they were 20% over that by 2019, and that was before COVID. So they have the resources, and they certainly are matching us. We don't have a choice. We have to engage. We are fragmented, but we are a minority of states. We think of ourselves as having run the world, but we are less than 10% of the global population. We aren't getting any bigger and we didn't change the world. And no single country, the US included, can stand up to the scale and strategic coherence of the China in these contexts unless we move out promptly and quickly on this, and we move out with allies. It's only with allies do we have the scale to force a sort of peer deference and a caution with China. And that's the only way we are going to basically, basically put some inroads on the uh, lead that China um, already had, however slim. And to do that, we have to make our own populations more aware of what can be done um, and not only what kinds of questions must be used, and of course, what kinds of threats one will expect to see. Now, I like to repeat this, uh, what uh, as Secretary Work pointed out, we have to move out promptly on the leadership, the talent, the hardware, and particularly the investment, because none of this is cheap. We need to operationalize this advantage we have in speed using our allies, and using particularly awareness. Uh, this is the original OODA loop, this is new OODA loop, and this is the Navy's AI stack, which looks very much like the other AI stack, but we've added compute, and we've just altered it enough to work for the Navy, and of course, all done within a values and, and an ethical structure. But we have to be at every single one of these points have to be there operating at a certain amount of caution. And the other thing we have to do is we have to get it out to the front edges. We have to move, as this I point out, the algorithms, not the data, but the algorithms have to move to the data. And I'm, uh, I take this straight from a uh, recent talk given by the Navy's chief, the, the, the Navy's chief uh, AI officer, Brent Vaughn, where he pointed out the focus is here. Uh, where you get it, the algorithms down to the device edge, to the enterprise edge, where the adversaries engage. And, and of course, all the way beyond and behind it as well. But, but this, is, this is where the low hanging fruit is. And it's also where the most rapid responses are necessary. Right? And navies in particular uh, have a role here. We have a special skills. We have, because we are going to be minority states in the rest of this world. And navies have always been very concentrated in ships and in any given context, they have to make special efforts to not let that concentration of force in ships to actually harm them, right? So navies have always been able to decouple and loiter and be more resilient over time. And they've had to adapt for this over the course of time and they continue to do it. 
whether or not navies today can execute on it, they have a culture that values independent operations. And this is something absolutely necessary for resilience in large scale socio-technical complex systems that are under stress by other large scale socio-technical systems. And final two points is navies tend to be technical services because these modern navies have an enormous amount of technology that makes that very vessel function, right? And so that means there's a, there is an openness to these kinds of modernizing uh, demands from the environment back on these systems. It may mean, and the Navy's already engaged in thinking about this, a different structure for fleet forces. Um, what if we have ships we have fleets, but we have swarms, and we have to rethink how we distribute those assets, and how do we loiter with the swarms? And stuff. So we're not alone, but the Navy is certainly stepping out on trying to get this working right. And so I'm going to end you with a last point or two that um, that this isn't uh, this isn't craziness. The current Navy approach. It's not like overhyped springs of the past. It's optimistic, but it's not crazy. It's being measured in actual efforts to, to get low hanging near term fruit. I mean, and, and for example, one of the enterprise objectives is to reduce toil across the service. That doesn't sound crazy. Um, and of course, work with autonomy. It absolutely recognizes the criticality of education of the entire force. And my good colleague, Dr. Michael Hara, is going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, and, and not just the force, but also our developers and our data curators, the ones that label and pick the data and, and make it work for us. And so I would argue that we're not going to have an AI winter this time around. And in any way, we don't have a choice, right? Because we have to engage the adversary now, there, where they're driving the world. And if we want to rest back and influence on the future path of that world, that we have to engage in this great systems conflict, understanding AI and how we can use it to those advantages with our allies we can never do this alone. Because if we try and do it alone and just go out, um, basically, as Franklin said, we don't hang together, and particularly in this coming world, we most certainly will hang separately. Thank you very much for listening to me. I am very much open to any questions. And as was said earlier, if you want to drop me an email, I'm happy to engage in, in a conversation about this. Dr. Demchek, thank you so very much for our wonderful and informative presentation. We appreciate your continued study and research in the area of artificial intelligence. I know the student body benefits greatly from you here at the Naval War College. <clears throat> I, now, I now would like to uh, introduce the next guest speaker, um, uh, Captain Michael O'Hara, United States Navy PhD Chair of the Wargaming Department at the U.S. Naval War College. Ken O'Hara is a permanent military professor. He received his PhD from Columbia University in political science. In 2015 to 16, he was appointed national security fellow with Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. His operational experience includes carrier jet aviation, S3B Viking, and naval intelligence with flying and staff deployments in three aircraft carriers and in Kabul, Afghanistan. His research interests include coercion, diplomatic signaling, and decision-making. A U.S. Naval Academy graduate, he earned a Master of Arts degree from the U.S. Naval War College and National Security and Strategic Studies, Master of Arts degrees in English and Political Science from the University of Rhode Island and Columbia University, respectively, a Master of Philosophy in Political Science from Columbia University, and his PhD in Political Science with a focus on international relations and comparative politics from Columbia University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Captain Mike O'Hara. George, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Uh, I want to extend my warm greetings to the trustees and to the members of the Naval War College Foundation uh, there in San Francisco, but around the world. Uh, and I want to express at the outset my gratitude for the opportunity to talk to you um, and to be in the same forum as Secretary Work and with my colleague, Dr. Chris Demchek. 
Um, you might be wondering, like, why in the world is someone with a degree in political science talking to you about uh, artificial intelligence? Well, um, my work in this area began about a year and a half ago. Um, it started when uh, I had been working on a future warfighting symposium at the Naval War College, which the War, uh, Naval War College Foundation has supported. Um, the future warfighting symposium was designed to increase the, the educational content for our mid-career students who are in residence in cyberspace and emerging technologies. And out of that work, um, I joined my colleague, Dr. Demchek, on a committee that was looking at expanding the education uh, in emerging technologies across the Navy and the Marine Corps. And during our work on that committee, um, we used AI as the, the primary use case. Uh, and so while working through that, uh, I saw an opportunity. I, I saw a need at the Naval War College to, to um, increase the number of offerings that we had in this space. And so I turned to a, another colleague, Professor John Hannes from the Wargaming Department, and he and I designed a course uh, called Artificial Intelligence for Strategic Leaders. Um, and this was something that we could offer through the electives program. Um, let's see. What I'm gonna offer you here today are my own views, and it's based on my experience from, from teaching this course, but it, it doesn't reflect any position of the War College or the Department of Defense or the, or the Navy. Um, what we focused on in this class was unpacking the black box, right? This is the subtitle of the course that we designed. And, um, and it was really about getting officers to look under the hood of AI and understand uh, fundamentally how is it working before they get bamboozled by, uh, by everyone out there who wants to sell them something or fairy dust some technology on their operational problems. So as, as, we, uh, as I unpack my, my presentation today, I'm gonna start by letting you know kind of where I'm coming from, um, offer some examples in, um, in, in an inductive attempt to define AI and machine learning, and then talk to you about how we in our class decomposed operational problems onto a taxonomy, and then give you a couple of examples of the work that our students were doing. So where am I coming from? Um, I started off at the Naval Academy. I uh, graduated and went to flight school. Um, I was privileged to fly the S3 Viking on, um, on Enterprise and Harry S. Truman, uh, but then I lateral to the Naval Intelligence community after, after the S3 Viking retired from service. That brought me to wonderful places like Afghanistan in 2005, where I worked for Combined Forces Command Afghanistan under General Barno and uh, General Eikenberry. And then um, I got to go back to sea now as an intelligence officer, again, with an air wing. And um, that was also in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. When I returned, uh, Back in CONUS, I came to the Naval War College as a student and then was selected for the Navy's permanent military professor program. This brought me to Columbia University, uh, where I had the opportunity to, to earn a PhD, and now I'm here permanently at the Naval War College for the rest of my career, I'm really getting to do what is truly my dream job. Um, and so I've been teaching in the strategy and policy department for the last six years, which many of you know well, either from your own experience or you, you know it by reputation is one of the premier strategy programs in the United States. Um, I work with uh, civilians. I work with militaries from 65 different countries, from um, all the different uh, members of the interagency and the IC. And, uh, and today I serve as the chair of the war gaming department. So the course that we designed uh, for the winter elective just a few months ago was a project-based class. Uh, it was a project-based class that was designed to introduce students without any prerequisites, truly uh, expecting that none of them had any knowledge of um, computer coding, of, of um, advanced statistics, data science, uh, none of that. And so what we did instead was leverage their operational backgrounds. I had students from the Army and the Air, from all of the services and a couple of civilians. We had 15 total. And um, the idea was to leverage their domain experience and ask them to focus on a project, a project that sought to introduce machine learning to solve some kind of problem that they knew well from their experience. 
By leveraging their experience, we could then partner with a community of interest. Um, we had folks from academia, from research labs, we had experts from the fleet and industry, and their job was to, um, to draft a proposal, a kind of proposal that decomposed the problem um, and applied the fundamentals, the, the fundamental data and computing requirements to solve that task. And, and ultimately, ideally, to be able to pass it off to someone at, for instance, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center or at the Defense Innovation Unit out there in the Bay Area um, to then ingest it into the acquisition program. Uh, we had about uh, 15 projects and uh, many of these were briefed subsequently in, in multiple fora um, and the students got a lot of good exposure in doing that as well. Um, the team, in the top right corner, you see I, with, I worked with my, my colleague, Professor John Hannes, um, but the team was this group of, gosh, nearly 20 folks that made the, uh, the class come to life. Primarily, we had a team of three individuals from MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Um, the course probably would not have been possible uh, at the same level of quality without them. Um, Dr. Julie Mullen, who runs the uh, supercomputing center there at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, she is uh, the curator of a number of online uh, lectures that the students were able to access each week in addition to the readings. And then for every uh, seminar, for each of the 10 seminar meetings over the trimester, uh, we had uh, Dr. Dennis Ross and Bill Stryline from MIT Lincoln Laboratory, um, two engineers slash data scientists who are you know, preeminent experts in this field. They attended every seminar as, ex as, uh, as I guess, colleagues or co-professors, if you will. And then they invited for each topic each week, one or two different experts from MIT Lincoln Laboratory to provide their technical expertise on the topic of the day. In, in addition, we had a sort of an, appli uh, an application or a practical visitor. So our naval affiliates came from, um, from NAV War, from ONR, from the submarine force, uh, we had folks from the Naval Academy and the Undersea Warfare Development Center. We had this really robust community that the students uh, partnered with, not just in the seminars, but these folks were available to them uh, afterwards as well, supporting their research. So as we explore some of the examples of artificial intelligence, um, I found with uh, our students that we got a lot of mileage by thinking about AI along a continuum, uh, a continuum from that varies from simple expressions of AI to much more complex applications. Uh, and we can think about it in terms of uh, a computer that's able to take a simple action or predict an outcome or even learn based on the data that it's presented, um, all the way to machines that can then relate to their environments. They can even master concepts, not just data, uh, and then transfer knowledge from one domain to another, even um, those that can evolve and, and update their own design. And so um, whether it's something as simple as setting the cruise control uh, in an if-then sort of rule-based system, um, we have a very, something that's like basic. It, no, none of us at this point in our lives really think about cruise control as artificial intelligence. That sounds absurd. Um, now, what about the, a probabilistic prediction of an election outcome? Um, that's based on a lot of data analysis, and, and um, it's also something that we, we have a lot of uh, understanding of at this point and hardly think of as artificial intelligence. Where I think we start to um, now enter the domain of AI con in a contemporary understanding is thinking about uh, machines that can learn, that can take feedback and, and reuse it and, and, and create its own rule set or predict a rule set based on the data without any programming. Um, if we think of yet another level of complexity, we might think about computers that are um, now creating its own, their own content based on what they perceive. So in this example, um, this ridiculous example from um, uh, the New York Times, this is a picture of two sumo wrestlers that are grappling and the text created by the, um, by the computer refers to the, the one man 
uh, looking over his shoulder and giving him a kiss on the cheek, which is absolutely absurd and not what's going on, but um, kind of funny to think about the limits of a computer for creating based on its perception. Um, if we consider the difference or, or consider a computer now trying to relate to another, how do we relate to other human beings? We're, we're perceptive in many ways, often trying to understand emotions as we see them uh, being displayed. And so here's an example of a computer trying to read the expression on a human face and trying to determine whether it is fear or disgust or joy or uh, some other emotion. Um, my children are able to tell the difference between a real tiger and a stuffed animal tiger, but a computer might still struggle with that. Um, this is obviously a, a cat, it has four legs, it has stripes and different colors, but um, the ability to transfer the concept of tiger from one to another and know that one will eat you and the other is something to cuddle with um, is something that a computer would obviously struggle with. And then finally, um, the idea that a computer might actually be able to dynamically change its design or its architecture and evolve in some way as the thing of movies. And those of you who have watched the movie uh, Ex Machina might have a, have a sense of that. Um, another way that we might think about um, artificial intelligence and its development, uh, certainly our familiarization with these things, is in terms of simple games, right? Um, so for instance, if we think about um, how machine learning has cut its teeth on games of perfect information. These are the games of perfect information, those where all of the information in the game is available to the players and uh, both players share the same level of information. And many of us are familiar with the IBM project. It started back in 1985. Um, and was renamed Deep Blue in 1989, and finally defeated Gary Kasparov, right, in 1996. But that was, that was a huge development after nearly 11 years of work just to win in a game of chess. Um, by contrast, AlphaGo, which uh, was a deep mind project working on the game of Go displayed on the far right of your screen, um, a human being wasn't beaten in this game until 2015, nearly 20 years later. Um, and finally, in 2017, beat the number one ranked person in the world. But, you know, so chess arguably seems um, simple compared to Go. And to illustrate that, I think the data on the screen um, provides some, some uh, wherewithal for this contrast. So chess, 64 positions. Um, that means there's 10 to the 47th possible moves. And ultimately, the number of games that you could have are 10 to the 123rd. By contrast, Go, far more complex, 361 different um, positions on the board with 10 to the 170th possible moves and 10 to the 360th um, possible games. So again, here's the situation where all the data are available to the computer, but what makes the difference between uh, beating Gary Kasparov in chess in 1996 or beating the number one ranked player in Go in 2017, this is a matter of computing power. Um, we'll talk about data uh, in a moment. Um, when I impart this to the students, it's really getting them to focus in on machine learning as uh, where the data are the inputs to the problem and that the outputs are the rules, that somehow the computer is understanding the game um, by, by processing more and more of the data. And so what we teach then is that machine learning is that field of computer science which is using statistical techniques that it really what's underpinning all of this is statistics and the ability to uh for the computer to uh, to learn by progressively improving its performance on some kind of specific task either through um reinforcement learning as uh chris demchek described earlier um in the next slide Before I go to that, I, I think what what became useful for our students is thinking about how then these um, very simple tasks like playing chess or playing checkers and, and, and 
learning from uh, the data and creating the rules could then be extrapolated onto something like computer vision uh, for the use of an oncologist in reading a chest x-ray and being able to identify an anomaly or a mass in a, in a field where it doesn't belong. Uh, and what, we, what we've what we learned now is that these machines are uh, able to do these readings at a, maybe a 98% capability or capacity, um, freeing up the human being to do for m- far more complex tasks. And now we find the, the possibility and the promise of human machine teaming going forward. Um, Right. So one of the challenges that we had as um, as we taught the course was the the broad nature of the definition of AI. And I'm glad the secretary work led off his presentation thinking, talking about this and specifying where on the spectrum uh, he was he was making a contribution, because um, f- for many people, it, it, it's it's too broad. In fact, uh, I mean, the DOD AI strategy um, is very similar to the Oxford English Dictionary or the uh, the Oxford Dictionary, and it's uh, the definition is similar to that of a uh, professor at Carnegie Mellon, which emphasizes the ability of machines to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. But that's pretty broad, and it can mean a lot of things to many many people. And so, what we tried to focus on in our class. Um, it, it, and it met re- some resistance because of the popular allure of the broader definition, but we tried to focus on machine learning um, in our class and specifically um, getting students to focus on the concept that the machine is in uh, that machine learning is the practice of getting machines to make decisions without being programmed. Whether that was through unsupervised learning where the the computer is making associations through clustering of uh, different categories of data or through supervised learning where the computer was doing something like more akin to statistical regression um, with the continuous variables and um, or classification of categorical variables. When uh, General Hyten spoke to the DOD um, uh, Joint Artificial Intelligence Center's conference in September 2020, uh, he he focused on these seven different building blocks of AI, and he you know he called out the hype, where most people tend to focus on uh, software, on the coding and the algorithms that are written. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about ethics in AI um, and even like how to engage with industry or international partners. But for him, uh, he said the two most important aspects of, of AI are data and computing. And so we really took that to heart in our class and we asked our students to then start to take the problems that they're focused on in the field and start to de- decompose them onto some kind of taxonomy. And this is where we really started to unpack the black box. Um, By breaking down their problems into four factors, uh, we we were able to get to the fundamentals. We we said, what are the data? Well, first of all, look at the right side of this. What is the task that you're trying to do? What's the output? What what are you asking machine learning or artificial intelligence to help you accomplish. And then walk that all the way back to the left. What are the inputs that you need for that output? What data do you begin with? Where is it collected? Where is it stored? What mechanism of computation is required to produce a function that ultimately accomplishes that task? And, And so, it really requires students to think about the ones and zeros about who owns those data where are they um where are they downloaded to and and what kinds of uh computers are going to be processing them before you can assign them to a uh, something on a task list like a universal task list and so if if we think about that uh the navy task list or the the joint integrated task list um we can think about an entire encyclopedia of these tasks from um, 
employing firepower, logistics, exercising C2, protecting the force, all of these um, fundamental Navy or, or military missions. Um, and, and for example, if what you're trying to do is improve your maintenance through some kind of machine learning, um, you can assign that to uh, Navy task 4.3.2.1 of preventive maintenance, and then walk it back to what flight logs and maintenance records you might draw upon, um, put it through some sort of stochastic process, and then ultimately schedule inspections to achieve that predictive maintenance. This is a, a taxonomy that was offered to us by um, a reservist, a, a Navy reservist named Lieutenant Commander John Alstreda, and he is a um, now a newly minted PhD from Stanford uh, who supports through his reserve work the Office of Naval Research. And his four-point taxonomy is, is one way of thinking about it. MIT Lincoln Laboratory offered us another, but it was really useful for breaking, this, breaking down um, the work that the students were trying to get after. Uh, what I'm gonna offer you now are three examples of the student work. Uh, one from one of our DOD uh, Department of Navy civilians, um, another from an Air Force officer and another from uh, a Navy Lieutenant. Um, the first is an example of predictive maintenance. Um, so Max Jones from Carter Rock had uh, a fascinating project on uh, trying to optimize the structural health of the Navy's vessels. So he's an engineer. He's a Bundy scholar uh, uh, attending um, the Naval War College as an in-resident student. Um, and his project looked at, um, well, broke it down in these ways. So this presentation shows in the top left corner what his mission solution was. Number two, what the data were that he believed were most important for making this work. Uh, third, the processes and the computing that would be required, what kind of infrastructure he might need. And then finally, he was thinking about this in terms of human machine teaming. This is the slide that Max created for a presentation to his peers. And it is um, it reflects the 20 page paper that he ended up producing uh, in a in a proposal format for the class. Um, but he was trying to use machine learning to make real time predictions of the structural health of the hull of any vessel. And he was using as input data uh, or the, his training data rather was um, using finite element modeling from um, from nav C and then other simulated data that they had and he he believed that that could be put through the DOD High Performance Computing Center's um, uh, uh, infrastructure. This is available via, well, there's a couple of ways that you can gain access to it, but um, it, it's available through a browser at, at, on both the unclassified and the SIPR net. Um, and similar to the way that machine learning might be used on uh, chest x-rays or something like that to support a physician, Max envisioned that machine learning could be used to complement the expertise of an operator at sea or inspectors um, in the shipyards or you know, engineers who are working at NAVC. He, didn't, he didn't see this as a substitute for their expertise. He saw it as a complement to it. And, um, and this was pretty common among all the students identifying that the, the promise of AI and the promise of machine learning was in this human machine teaming. And he believed that by fielding this capability that he was proposing, um, that it would support a sort of field to learn model, that we would learn a lot more as a community about the structural health of our vessels and the techniques for uh, uh, predictive maintenance by using this. Um, L.J. Rivers, a lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, fighter pilot, um, leveraged his experience in the cockpit to offer um, this signature management prediction tool. And so this could be used by uh, fighter pilots or unmanned aircraft. What he, what he experienced that anyone who's ever been a cockpit has experienced is just the task overload, right? You have, there's way too much information. Uh, and so 
you're a single seat pilot in a cockpit, you're trying to manage multiple radios and data links and um, active and passive sensors while you're also trying to lead a combat formation and meet the timelines of a mission. Um, and then also manage things like weather or G forces or, oh, by the way, the enemy uh, who's trying to kill you. And so um, what he was working through were what he would love to have in the cockpit. Wouldn't it be great if the computer could just recommend to me where to steer in order to avoid getting shot? And in order to avoid getting shot, he would have to manage his signature, right? And so um, what the value I saw in, in his work was that he was able to identify all of those different data sources that would be necessary to be computed in order to produce that kind of output. What you see is just a sort of fictitious representation in the bottom right corner of a 3D steering dot. So it, there it is in his HUD and he just kind of flies to that dot and that would be the computer's recommendation or pr uh, prediction about where he would be safest. And it's based on all of that data that's in the far, uh, in the bottom left corner which is coming off of the aircraft itself from all of its sensors, its information uh, regarding the weapon engagement zone and even terrain data so that he wasn't gonna fly into a mountain or something like that. And it generates for him a prediction, generates a, a, a little pipper that he would steer to. Uh, and then finally, um, one of another one of the outstanding projects was done by Lieutenant Chris Linich, uh, who, was, uh, who is a submariner and uh, was thinking about how AIML could be used um, to support mission analysis. And he saw the promise where, um, where machine learning could take the sonar data uh, and then start to, it could be used not again, not to, su not to substitute for the human expertise, but to aid and, and uh, complement it. Um, he wanted to improve the unit level training he, in the mission environment without having to offload everything um, for post-mission analysis to, uh, to a third site. So he would take the, uh, the sonar data, it would get converted to uh, a computer vision technique. And then specifically, he was thinking about using convolutional neural networks, that, which Dr. Jemchek uh, described in her talk uh, just previously. And it would ultimately shorten the amount of time for post-mission intelligence. And he believed that he could increase the amount and the availability of uh, processed sonar data, labeled sonar data um, that could be used not just by the crew, but then um, across the DOD because the experts were going to be pr processing it and labeling it, which is often one of the, the most difficult challenges. Now, these kinds of... Um, these kinds of projects, which are talking about predictive tools for the cockpit or um, submarine post-mission analyses, or, or even the uh, structural health, they, these might seem very tactical. They might seem like these are solutions that are way in the weeds um, and not at the strategic level that, that uh, we often um, are thinking about at the Naval War College. But I argue that it's absolutely necessary for our leaders to have some understanding about the ones and zeros, to have some understanding about what are the requisite data um, and, and where those reside, because ultimately these are organizational problems. These are, these are institutional problems. And until we have an understanding about how you move from inputs to outputs, under the hood, inside the black box, um, it's gonna be very difficult, I think, to apply these to the operational level of war or the strategic level of war in a way that is credible. Um, the Naval War College you know, is the leader in educating and developing leaders. Um, and we spent a lot of time, as Secretary Work described, addressing how the character of war is changing, not just because of technology, but because of social dynamics, because of the, the, the nature of great power competition and, and, and the change that we are now living in a multipolar world. Um, I, I think that artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies are increasingly part of an officer's preparation. And I, what we see, what I'm, I'm seeing among my students is that AI and emerging technologies has to be part of their 
curriculum, whether it's through the Future Warfighting Symposium, which you've supported, um, or through electives like this, and then other learning opportunities that the college supports. Um, this is part of that framework for developing so that they're ready for future operations and for leadership in, in a world where the, our adversaries are, have a goal and are determined to, um, to beat us to the punch. Um, that's all I have. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you today. Um, my email is listed here on the screen if you'd like to contact me, but look, I look forward to engaging with you in discussion. Admiral Hara, many thanks to you as well for that exceptional and thoughtful presentation. I know your students at the college and of course colleagues in DC benefit greatly from your continued research, study and analysis. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I recognize that we did not offer a question and answer segment for our last two guest speakers, but that was intentional. I would now like to invite the Honorable Bob Work back to the microphone for a brief collaborative Q&A session with Dr. Demchek and Kat Mohara as a way to link Secretary Work's opening remarks with those presented by Dr. Demchek and Kat Mohara in the form of a brief moderated discussion. We have just a, a, a couple of moments, but perhaps some final thoughts from uh, Secretary Work, uh, Dr. Demchek and Kat Mohara. Secretary Work. Well, I enjoyed both Chris and Mike's uh, presentations very much. Uh, uh, Chris's, I had never heard of the systems com uh, competition the way that Chris had done it, but I think it gives the audience a clear picture that China is a different competitor than the United States has ever faced. The United States has never competed against a competitor or even group of competitors with a GDP greater than 40 or 45 percent of its own. And China has already passed us in purchasing power parity. They are probably going to pass us in absolute GDP by the end of the 20s. And we simply have never gone up against a competitor that has a bigger economy than we do. We've also never gone up against a competitor with the technological wherewithal of China. The Soviet Union was able to compete with us in niche areas like space, nuclear weapons, undersea capabilities they were really good at. But in the broad panoply of technological uh, advances like microprocessors, uh, they just couldn't hang with us. They knew they couldn't hang with us. Our strategies were based on the fact they couldn't hang with us. And we simply just don't have that with, with the Chinese. So I thought Chris really laid that out well. I like the way both Chris and I tried to explain to you a little about how AI works. The reason it's that important is if we really believe in human machine collaboration, the humans are going to have to understand the inputs they're getting from AI. And they're going to have to make a judgment on whether or not to follow those recommendations. If all a commander is going to do is do what the machine recommends and get rid of the commander, just go with the system. What you have to have is commanders who have a general sense on how these systems work and will be able to use their input as judgments uh, that they then make in the crucible of combat. And I thought both Chris and Mike kind of gave you a very good sense at a high level um, on what these things are doing. A couple of things I just want to mention on the Go game that uh, Mike talked about, that was the Sputnik moment for China in AI. Uh, Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, the chairman of uh, the National Security Commission on AI, was in China when that game occurred. And when it became apparent that the machine was going to beat the Chinese grandmaster, they took it off all of their television channels. They just stopped, uh, stopped. And Eric was in the room when it happened. Uh, so that no one could explain to the 200 million Chinese who were watching the game uh, what happened. And it shook up everybody from President Xi down to, you know, the Chinese citizen. And at that point, they said, we 
are going to lead in this technology. And if AI can beat a Go Grandmaster, we know they're going to be able to beat a US commander. And so they just went all in. Uh, the United States hasn't had that Sputnik moment yet. Uh, so hopefully you all got a sense that, uh, hey, we got to we got to get after this. And so uh, I really enjoyed listening, uh, Chris and Mike, to you. And uh, I would just say that things are cool. Things are happening. DARPA has been working on this thing called Brainstorm, which takes the storm campaign model and uh, it helps you know, humans make combat decisions. And they just had 30 games and they called one team the Centaur team because it was uh, young men and women with an average of nine years of military experience. And they would use the AI and they would go up against what they called the human team with an average experience level of 25 years plus. And uh, the final outcome, you know, this is only the first time. It's really clunky. It's not as good. It's going to get good. Uh, but there were 17 human wins. So the ones with all sorts of experience and 13 centaur wins. But you had uh, the most junior player in the tournament who was someone who was a young woman who didn't have any military experience, and she defeated a 25-year-old Army lieutenant colonel and West Point professor uh, in the game. And so it just gives a sense that human-machine collaboration is really going to change things. And we better be at the forefront of that, because we don't want to go up against a competitor in which every single commander has AI enabled decision making tools, and we don't. So, uh, I, uh, Chris, Mike, Bravo Zulu, really great. Um, yeah, we got to get this one right. Uh, this is <laughs> this is not something. This is not a competition we want to lose. Secretary Warwick, thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Demchek, any final thoughts? Uh, abs absolutely. We uh, we have very little time left on this one. And um, certainly we need for everyone watching this to um, try and have an understanding of what AI does, um, because you have to keep in mind the Chinese are already planning on using AI to compensate for the very um, difficulties they have in their own military services. They are embracing it as a way to compete with us and our speed of uh, our agile, our agility and responsiveness and innovation. And they are promoting it as a Chinese um, right of passage. And so once you, you have folks committed to that, then they fight harder for it because you can't take it away from them. So we are up against an adversary we've never seen before. And uh, absolutely, everything uh, Secretary Work said, we, we need to get smarter. Thank you, Dr. Demchek. And Captain Mike O'Hara, any final thoughts, sir? Yes, thank you. Um, so first, I want to say again how grateful I am to be a part of this today. and. I think this reinforces the challenge. Uh, it, it reinforces the challenge for us as uh, naval officers uh, and as educators. We recognize that the opportunity to go to the Naval War College for a mid-career officer is a golden opportunity, right? There's, there's very, it's a very rare opportunity that one has to take 10 months to a year away from operational responsibilities and leadership to think, to read, to, to really learn and, and to learn not only about your service, but about the other services and uh, our international partners. And our students are being uh, challenged to think about history, culture, politics, uh, economics, and, and, and all of the different emerging technologies that might be influencing the way that we fight and the reason that we're fighting. Uh, so now what we're introducing today is yet another challenge, right? It is this increasingly complex technology, which as Secretary Work outlined, is potentially 
changing the fundamental features of war at the operational level and the strategic level. Uh, it's a challenge to pack this into the classroom, frankly, uh, when we have so many other things that we're trying to address. So I think the challenge that we're grappling with is, is how to do it all, right? And, and how to teach the fundamentals of strategy, how to teach the fundamentals of operational art and theater and national security decision-making while also de um, uh, introducing students to these new technologies and encouraging them and challenging them to think about how it's going to change uh, not only their own operational culture and their leadership approaches, but um, the future force as well. Uh, it, it's a privilege to be able to do this kind of work and uh, grateful to be able to share it with you today. Thank you. Secretary Work, that was outstanding. Captain O'Hara, Dr. Demchek, thank you so much. Your comments were on point, highly informative for a broad range of our audience. We're going to be continuing this discussion over the next several months and into next year as we drill down further on what constitutes the threat of AI behind national security. You've done a wonderful job kicking this off. It's extremely important and we're grateful. Uh, for Secretary Work, Bob, um, we commissioned a special plaque for you in appreciation for taking this on, given everything else on your plate. Um, one of our trustees, has three sons who have served in uh, the military, two in the Marines, and one in the Navy SEALs who's currently still deployed. Between deployments, he prepared a plaque with the Naval War College, um, which we are going to present to you when we are together again. It's the Navy War College and uh, the topographical overlay of Coasters Harbor and that wonderful facility that we all enjoy going to at Nav Station Newport. So I will personally um, hand this off to you in Newport um, or in Washington, D.C. when we're next together. And Chris and Mike, I look forward to handing you a chairman's coin. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. You're doing wonderful work for the War College and you're fantastic stewards of the foundation's philanthropic funding. So bravo, Zulu. Thank you, Chairman Bilden. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the first presentation in our series of events that address the national security challenges of artificial intelligence. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. We'll join us in August for the Naval War College Foundation's Newport Summer Symposium, where we will host the second presentation of artificial intelligence on the front lines, titled Artificial Intelligence and Impact on Defense. Lieutenant General Groen, United States Marine Corps, commander of the Artificial Intelligence Center, will present the keynote address. Thank you again for joining us and for your continued support and advocacy. Please know that your continued financial support in the form of gifts, donations, and sponsorships assist us greatly in supporting the rewarding missions of the U.S. Naval War College and Naval War College Foundation to educate today, secure tomorrow. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And don't forget to get your bid or bids in for the Foundation's Patriots Auction. And if you want to learn more about the Naval War College Foundation or become a member or offer support for the U.S. Naval War College, please visit us at our website, nwcfoundation.org, and click on membership or give. Finally, again, a very special shout out to Trustee Emeritus Dick Rosenberg and his wife, Barbara, for their longtime support for this symposium. Thank you. Stay safe and farewell for now.
I'm the retired chief executive officer of the Bank of America. I've had a few achievements, but being a trustee of the War College Foundation ranks right up there. I often thought when I was running the Bank of America, and we had, at that time, I think 88,000 people in 36 countries around the world, as much responsibility as I had then as CEO, it was not as much responsibility as uh, being the officer of the deck underway, steaming, you know, 750 yards from another ship in dock and ship conditions. That Navy experience gave me the confidence that, you know, running 80,000 people in 36 countries is really not all that hard. So many of us, uh, and I'll certainly count Barbara and myself among those, have been extremely lucky, and now it's time to give back. The U.S. Naval War College is a national treasure. It trains not just Navy officers or military officers. It trains civilian groups who would be appropriate. The first responders in the New York City area after 9-11, you know, went to war games at the War College. Where else could they have gotten so quickly the ability to rebuild their command staff than out of the games taught by the War College? We really had no idea about the uh, losses that the New York Fire Department took. The Fire Department led from the front. Their senior officers did not sit on the curb with a walkie-talkie. Many times, they went right up with their own firefighters. So when the floor went out from under them, basically not only did they lose firefighters, but in particular, they lost senior leadership. At the U.S. Naval War College, we introduced them to and helped them think about the range of problems that they could well face. It may not be an airplane crashing into a building like this again, but it may be bacteria, or it may be a dirty nuclear device, or it may be a real nuclear device. How are we going to respond to this? And just work it right up and then game it, and then work it, and then game it, and work it and game it. War games are just a superb teaching tool. That's what we introduced them to and enabled them to start doing, which they quickly, of course, began doing for themselves. Commander Antoinette Weems Gorman from the Jamaica Defense Force Coast Guard. Attending the U.S. Naval War College is considered uh, a critical course for us to do in, in order to progress into senior command. The most important part of the experience is really the interaction with so many different professionals in maritime environment and from different countries, different cultures. It has assisted me um, in, in conducting operations. So you, you know someone that is on the other end of the phone or the person who you're emailing, you have common ground and um, the, the history of being here together so you can talk about it freely, what the issue is and solve it. Money that uh, we've given to the War College, we feel good about. I think that War College is more effective in uh, ensuring America's uh, place in the world than the State Department is. I think what goes on in the War College, I think that's terribly valuable to the stability of America's position in the world.